against the Voice of Wrestling dot com and Virtual Sports Network Pro Wrestling Podcast. I'm Rich Bridge, alongside, as always, Mr. Joe Lanz. And Joe, we are back with another great guest and a good line of guests coming up. Yeah, let me tell you, for the next month and a half or so, we are pretty much packed with guests from St. Louis Anarchy. We've got Gary J coming up. We've got Pierre Abernathy, who's one of the favorite guests of our listeners coming back. We've got Darren Corbin. We've got Evangelistico. And today we've got today's guest, TJ Perkins, probably one of the most well-traveled veterans on the scene. And, and you know, it's, it's very uncomfortable <laughs> calling him a veteran because he's still firm, firmly rooted in his 20s. But this guy's been wrestling forever. TJ, how you doing? I'm doing very well, guys. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thankfully he's still older than me, so I could still feel good. So, <laughs> I'm not going to disclose my age, but, <laughs> but, uh, but, but anyway, St. Louis Anarchy—they've got Circus Maximus coming up. That's their big show, uh, Friday night, June 28th, all in Illinois at the uh, Knights of Columbus. Tickets start at ten dollars, and there are one dollar draft beers. You cannot beat that. And uh, on that show, our guest today, TJ Perkins, will be taking on ACH in a two out of three falls match, which obviously uh, has the potential to be something special. So, uh, TJ, have you wrestled ACH before, and uh, what's it like getting in the ring with him? Uh, yeah, you know, um, it, this is probably the first time uh, in a long time that I've I've uh, <laughs> changed up my training regimen specifically for one night for one guy, like. Uh, uh, just because he's at, uh, I think he's at level of a of a wrestler. Um, I've had the pleasure of being in there and competing with him a couple times now, uh, which I guess is the reason why they want us to uh, to to uh, do it again for for a, a longer format this time. So uh, we're gonna give you know hopefully a few rounds that night. And uh, I mean I can't speak enough about the guy. He's he's amazing. Yeah, we've been on the ACH train a long time here. Uh, we've had him on the show. We've we've uh, we've we've uh, tried to tell the world how great this guy is, and he's finally starting to break out now. As most people know, he's with Ring of Honor now and uh, getting more exposure there. And um, this it seems like a two out of three falls match against T.J. Perkins is uh, is going to be something special. But uh, as far as your career goes, you know, we we referenced it uh, during the intro, but. You know, you're still a relatively young, well, not even a relatively, you are still a young man, but you've been <laughs> wrestling for a long time. You started at the age of 14, is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Now, ha- tell us how that all came about. Well, uh, I, uh, there was really never like one specific time when, I, I could, as far as I can remember, that I could point to where I said, well, I'm going to be a wrestler someday. I just, I don't know. I kind of always grew up feeling in an odd way, like the, eventually I'll do that, you know, that type of thing. And, uh, I mean, as early as I could possibly remember, I just kind of assumed that I would be doing that someday when I was like three or four years old. Um, and, uh, when I, uh, got a little older, so maybe like 11 or 12, I started to kind of understand like, you know, what a future actually is, you know, so I'm getting a little right. older and, um, and so uh, I had always figured that when I go to high school, I'd, I'd become an amateur wrestler, and I'd wrestle, graduate, and then I'd make a progression from there. But uh, before I was set to start high school, I found out that we didn't have an amateur team. They had gotten rid of the program years and years prior to that. So um, I just figured I'd skip ahead and uh, and see like how I could, how I would uh, begin wrestling and. Uh, at the time, it was really hard. I, I did. I was just talking with uh, somebody about this yesterday, uh, and they they posed the same question. And it's it's really weird the amount of changes that have come about just in the timeline of my career. Like I came in at a very weird time. Uh, so back in like 1998, there like the internet wasn't really that big of a thing, and um, you know things were taped on VHS still and. And most places didn't have websites, and really the only thing you could find on the internet was WWF. So, um, so I was, you know, and there's no Facebook or MySpace, you know, it's just a very different time for social media, I guess. And so, um, you know, I was looking around, and Shawn Michaels was set to open the gym, but like not for another year. And, uh, I think I sent away for some info for Dean Malenko, who had a training facility in Florida. And, but all these things were not options for me because I was only 13 years old. And then, uh, I found some stuff closer to home. There's some in San Francisco. I think that was all pro wrestling. I featured and be on the mat. 
Um, but again, that's uh, up in the San Francisco Bay Area. So for people not from California, that's that's you might as well be two states away. That's that far. Yeah. And uh, yeah. So and I couldn't drive. So. <laughs> um, but lucky for me, just being in Los Angeles, there's such heavy, authentic Lucha Libre culture here. So I came to find that there's actually a lot of gyms out here that were options for me that they didn't, they weren't very heavily regulated. And they would, you know, because of the culture of the sport in Mexico, they would allow, you know, younger people to train, which still was rare at the time. But, you know, they made an exception for me. And so I just started when I was 14. Uh, right when I started high school, and the the rest is history. Been wrestling pretty much full time ever since. One kind of fascinating story that that I sort of saw from your your history is how you kind of dealt with working independent wrestling and doing high school at the same time. And, and I know there's there's stories that you know guys would pick you up on Fridays and you ditch Friday classes and that sort of stuff. What was that sort of atmosphere like? And maybe w- what did people around you or your know, friends or parents or something like that? What did they kind of say? Because you're you're doing that that hard indie life and you're you know you're 15 years old or whatever. So <laughs> yeah, like. Uh... So I had my first match when I was 14, and so from my first two years of wrestling, you know, I was 14 to 15 years old, and I couldn't drive. Um, it was, <laughs> it's a lot like uh, when you see in period pieces, like in movies, when they have like a montage of people in various lifestyles and they're kind of traveling by the seat of their pants type of thing, and <laughs> they're just like throwing suitcases in a car and going and like it's kind of like that is my <laughs> recollection of it it's just very uh it's exactly how you put it i mean i would uh i'd be at school you know half the week and uh I'd, i would go to training every night and then come about thursday i would uh i think uh maybe thursday or friday depending on what i had for the weekend i would uh ditch the second half of the day and sneak out of school and have uh you know, local wrestlers who were going on the same loop, they'd pick me up, and then I would just, I would just sleep in back seats and and on couches or on floors or in locker rooms for the weekend and wherever we were going. And then uh, Monday morning, they would drop me back off at school, oftentimes, and I uh, just continue continue my life like in a seamless manner. Um, that sounds, family, that sounds great. What did your parents think? Yeah, that's, that's I gotta know. <laughs> Um, well, my family didn't really keep uh, close tabs on me, so they, uh, I grew up, I, I mean, the household I grew up in, my parents traveled a lot. They were, they both worked for TWA Airlines, so my childhood, mostly they were absent anyway, so they, they just got used to never really having to watch after me. I was, uh, I, you know, never really got into trouble, so when I got older, they never questioned if I was like going to go to parties with friends or something, which I rarely did because I was wrestling. But in their mind, whatever I was doing, whether it was career or social or otherwise, they figured that I could manage myself. So they didn't really know and they didn't really care. They just, they never asked me. So I just, to to this day, it's never, it's never been asked. (laughs) Wow. Were you ever crossing the border at this point? Yeah, all the time. Uh, My first, I want to say it like, a handful of my first ten matches were probably in Tijuana. Wow! And your parents had no idea you were there. <laughs> no idea. No idea. I mean, there were times. I mean, I remember being. I mean, this is a couple of years later. Like I was sixteen and getting held up at gunpoint by the police in Mexico, who were just you know looking for a payout or you know whatever for Americans yeah. crossing over. And it was the middle of the night, so it's that type of thing happens. You know, sometimes. Um, I, I remember being 16 and having a machine gun pointed at my face while I sit on a curb and a, uh, a foreign police officer dumps my bag out on the sidewalk to see if they can take money or whatever they find. And I remember thinking, this is insane. I mean, I have friends that are doing math homework and playing video games right, right. now. <laughs> really is unbelievable. Um, you know, it, it, from that point, it didn't take you very long to hook up with the, uh, with the New Japan Dojo in L.A., how did that all come about? How old were you, and, and what was the hookup there? That was really very kind of serendipitous, I guess, um, because uh, so the first couple of years of my career was like that. So from 14 to maybe about 16, I was wrestling, uh, I guess you could say regional league. So I'd go, I'd, I'd do everything out here in Southern California. I'd go up to the Bay Area. I'd go over to Nevada and wrestle in Vegas. Um, over to Phoenix and wrestle in Arizona and then across the border in Tijuana, Mexico and the border cities in Mexico. So I had like 
you know, three or four states worth of, of stuff that I would do in this corner of the country, I guess. And then, um, around the time when I was 16 or so, uh, I don't know, maybe like 99, 2000, maybe earlier than that. So it's, uh, it's probably 15 or so. Uh, they, WWF had developed, had, uh, set up a developmental gym out here through UPW, um, a place called Ultimate Pro Wrestling. And so, and that's where John Cena and Victoria and a lot of, some of the, some of the more famous people, uh, had come from. Um, they were trainees there. And so when they set that up out here, obviously, you know, that's, everybody wants to be there and go there. And, um, the wrestling was a lot less formal at the time. So, I mean, it was easier to kind of try to put a bid in and get in the door somewhere as opposed to now when it's like, um, you almost have to be handpicked to go somewhere. Um, so at the time, just like anybody else that's motivated, I, you know, that's the place where I need to be. So that's my next progression. And so I would go there and I'd be on their TV tapings and, you know, train in the gym with all those guys. And, and, uh, but you know, I'm only 16 years old, so it's not like I'm exactly in line for like a WWF contract or anything like that. But, right, right. um, so, but I was good enough that, you know, they, I was still wrestling on all the shows and training and, you know, like I would train with Cena a lot and stuff like that. Um, but I was just a kid, so it's not like I was getting a serious look from anybody. Um, and, uh, shortly after they disbanded that developmental and, and I think they just kept it strictly to Ohio Valley, um, UPW just being good business people, they developed a new working agreement this time with Zero One in Japan. And Zero One had just recently been kind of an offshoot of New Japan. So some of their office structure was through the Inoki family. And, uh, they knew that New Japan wanted to set up a gym in Los Angeles, uh, in the next year or so. So they just kind of took, you know, the best people they could find around. And then that just happened to be when myself and Samoa Joe and the Vanna Pitbulls, um, we were basically the first class there. So it just kind of right place, right time. And how long did it take uh, from hooking up with that before they sent you on your first New Japan tour? Um, let's see. I was probably in – we were probably training in the gym – just the four of us basically and Danielson came eventually uh, Brian Danielson came several months later I'd say we're there for maybe a little less than a year and actually let me backtrack who's who's actually doing the training at at the New Japan Dojo so when they opened it uh, because of Antonio Noki and his uh, his um, his upbringing in, in wrestling um, in the gym in Tokyo, he founded, when he founded the company itself, he founded it, uh, off of Gotch and, and all the training is, was traditional catch wrestling and stuff like that. So this was basically his baby to work with, the LA gym. Um, the Tokyo gym has since been, you know, uh, conformed a certain way to the way the company wants it. So he kind of reverted back to the original way he envisioned the company in the seventies. And so all of our training was through, initially it was through Justin McCauley, who's a fighter turned pro wrestler. And, uh, all of our coaches were fighters. So we, and yeah, at the time, MMA was really kind of a premature thing. It wasn't a big thing yet. And so, you know, we had a lot of guys coming in and out as guest coaches, um, for us, but all we ever did was box and, and, uh, and submission wrestle. I mean, there were like several weeks in a row where we didn't even get in the ring. Um, it was all, it was all grappling and, and boxing. So, and like you say, this is this is like this is pretty much pre Zufa before MMA and UFC really took off as as a mainstream thing. So uh, yeah, yeah. So I mean, like we would get guys like we would have um, you know some guys that were Pride fighters. We'd have guys from the Shark Tank come down as guests. Uh, there's a, a training center called the Raw Center in Los Angeles, and uh, those guys would come in. Those guys are pretty awesome amateur wrestlers. Um, and, uh, we'd have some lion's den people. We'd have some pretty famous people come in and, and work with us. Like Ken Shamrock was coached us for a little while. Um, Josh Barnett spent a lot of time with us. Uh, we, you know, we had a lot of guys, Boss Rutten. Um, I mean, I could probably, wow. I'd probably go on forever. It's like a I mean, every, it, Yeah. Some yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, it really was. I mean, Don Fry and uh, Kazuki Fujita, and I mean, there's just tons of guys. I mean, even uh, Herb Dean, the UFC head referee, he uh, he was training with us. He was he was oh, wow. uh, a guest in some of our practices all the time. So uh, yeah, and and I'd say like every every month or so there would be like a week where there would be it was like open to the press. So, you know, when you watch like, um, like, you know, Pacquiao Cotto 24 seven or like Mayweather right. Guerrero 20, you know, like, and they have media days where they're in the gym and there's tons of people there. And you know, on a normal day, those people aren't always there. Right. Um, and then there's all this press in there and we would have that, like maybe once a month we'd have a week where it's like, like, like there's, Ken Shamrock, five guys from Pride, a few guys that would eventually be in UFC, and then like Ryota Machida, like all these guys are in there, and we and it was just like a big nexus, a big like United Nations of world class fighters, and right. here's us, like we're like we're <laughs> we're you know <laughs> kind of just stuck in the middle of all that, and then there's you know people taking video and pictures for you know magazines in Japan and stuff like that. Um, it was a crazy experience, you know. And was this like heavy sparring that was going on? I mean, what they have you guys doing? Uh, it was sparring and, uh, and and you know live grappling, and it wasn't too heavy. I don't remember anybody getting seriously hurt or anything. I mean, you get your bell rung and everything like that. I mean, right. It's uh, it's not different than you would see in like a, a in a training camp, like from twenty four seven or anything like that. Just uh, just always a different mixed group of people. Yeah, and, and we'll kind of move on to the, sort of the next step. I mean, you mentioned, you, you know, you're 14, 15, 16, and you're traveling to Mexico. Well, now, it, you know, you, you're going over to Japan re- relatively early into your kind of career. What was that sort of experience like? I mean, that's another – I mean, you're already traveling more than most wrestlers already do, and you're what how, – how old are you at this point when you're kind of debuting uh, in Japan? Uh, so I probably got into the gym there first when I was 17, and then uh, – I don't know if, it, if they timed it like this or if it just happened to be this way, but um, our first tour, we all went on together, and it was just two weeks after my 18th birthday. And New Japan, unlike, I mean, and it's not to, like, take other places down a peg or anything like that, but the level of company they are, everything is done very formal. So, like, you know, we have contracts and visas and everything. Yes. Um it's not like, you know, like when, when I'm traveling as a young wrestler, if I go to like take matches in Canada, like I pretend I'm visiting family or something so that I don't get hassled by, by border patrol or anything like that. But with like New Japan, just like with WWE or anything, or, you know, WCW, TNA and all that, like they, you know, they have to file and process all of our formal papers, which they couldn't do because I was only 17. So I don't know if they timed it that way, that they sent us after I was 18, but it was like, as soon as I was 18, they said, okay, we're taking you to the consulate, get your visa, now you can go. And so I was able to go. Now, at um, this point, at this point now, are you, are you a student of wrestling at this point? In other words, were you a big fan at this point? Did you, did you understand the magnitude of being 18 years old and going to work for New Japan is basically what I'm getting at? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, to this day... New Japan has always really been my bucket list thing. I mean, there's several things on my bucket list and I've been, I've been blessed and very, very, I mean, extremely lucky to have checked off pretty much everything now. Um, but to me, I always thought that New Japan and CMLL respectively were two places I would never, ever attain. Like that was untouchable. Like, I mean, if I was playing video games, that's like the, that's the unlockable achievement that will never be touched. You know, like, so, you know, I just felt like, you know, if I get older, you know, then someday it's like, okay, at the time it was like, okay, WCW is attainable. Obviously they folded. So <laughs> it didn't, didn't work out a couple of years into my career. Uh, but then I, you know, you just think, okay, well, WWF someday, like that's something I could do. It's here. But how on earth do you get to the other side of the world? And, and like, how do you, like, what is, how do you even go about that ladder? How do you climb that? Like, um, and it just so happened that it fell on my lap right away, both of them consecutively, New Japan and CML. So, like, to me, it was a huge shock. Like, I was on top of the world, like, because that, that was my dream job. Yeah, where do you go from here now? Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, and it's, I mean, everybody's goal is to go to, to WWE, and same as me, but, like, 
just on a personal level, I had such a favoritism for those places, and I was like, I couldn't believe it. And uh, obviously being that young, like, not until, you know, years later, maybe even just now, I mean, I'm starting to realize the added value of having done that so young, but um, but I, I knew the, the levity of it um, as soon as it happened. It was just incredible. I mean, I was 18 years old walking down the Tokyo Dome ramp, and it's like, God, I can't believe this, you know? You know, coming over from the American Dojo and, and you guys all being uh, pretty young, were you treated like young boys when you were there, or were you brought in as sort of uh, – what, what was kind of the feel there? Um, mostly just me. Everybody else was treated like the normal American gaijin wrestler. Um, like, uh, so if, if we compare my generation of juniors going over there, like me, the Pitbulls and Danielson, to like older generations of say like, you know, Guerrero, Malenko, Benoit, that type of thing, um, I was like the Benoit. Like, I was the guy that they were like, okay, you're going to stay in the dojo. You're going to do all these squats. You're going to stay in between tours and train. And the other guys will be in junior title matches. So um, so it was different, I think, because of my age is, is why they did that. Do you remember your first match? Over, was it in Kirken Hall or was it? Uh... Uh, yeah, uh, we had uh, the first thing we did was actually called a MUGA tour. A MUGA spelled M-U-G-A, and it's um, it was uh, kind of a it was Fujinami's thing, and it was basically based on it was the style was supposed to be based on original cash wrestling, but it, they didn't really enforce that, so people would just wrestle however they wanted. Um, but that was our, our debut <laughs> tour right right before the Tokyo Dome, um, and uh, so the first show was at Cork and Hall. Then we went up to Osaka, and then back to Cork and Hall, and then um, eventually it was there was the Tokyo Dome, and then a normal tour right after. Um, so the first the first two out of three matches were at Cork and Hall. So you were thrown right into I mean all these buildings that you're probably watching on videotape at that time, and uh, were, were you in awe walking in, or were you, I mean you're still a young kid. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean. You walk in the tunnel and you're looking at the interview station that you see all your like all these uh, heroes of yours would sit down and talk to press and you're like wow this is this is here like I'm here and then uh, I think the surreal moment was being in the ring and and them announcing us from the corner and listening to you know the the ring announcers speak those words live right in front of you is is uh, is kind of a weird experience so. Um, you know, that was really cool. And for me, it was really cool because, uh, the second match in Osaka, um, I, they had me wrestle a uh, tiger mask. So, I mean, just for me personally, that was a, a huge deal. So and, was and, that, and, the, oh, I'm sorry, was, go ahead. No, that's okay. Was that the current tiger mask at this point? Probably, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, so I was going to ask, I mean, you mentioned Tiger Mask, and, and, and that was kind of, uh, maybe talk about your transition into sort of a new character in that sense where you, um... You kind of took over, uh, you know, I'm reading here, they said, you know, the American answer to Tiger Mask or whatever, and they kind of gave you a different gimmick and all that sort of stuff. Talk about that. I mean, because that, that really shows a lot of promise in you. I mean, obviously, you're still at a super young age, and they're really kind of gravitating towards you or actually giving you, you know, some new ideas and storylines and, and a whole new gimmick and that stuff. Yeah, um, I uh, I don't know that they intended, like, to ever have, like, a huge investment in, in me creatively or anything like that, but it was... It was really cool of them to 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 take the time to like kind of analyze my angle on, on my career separately and, and give me uh, you know give it new life so to speak. Um, when I first came into training, and just because I, you know maybe just because Sayama is such a big uh, influence on me, um, they noticed the similarities like immediately. So when the when the office would come over to LA and and take a look at our progression before we ever went to Japan. It was immediately they noticed like all the similarities um, between my style and, and uh, Sayama, which at the time was a lot more like Sayama than it is now. I've I've grown into like other avenues as I've gotten older, but um, that and they also thought I was like Ray Mysterio because I was so small. But <laughs> uh, 
but uh um so after my first couple tours they uh you know uh so they had me wrestle tiger mask a few times my first couple tours and then there were some matches like at the end of tours they would have me tag with tiger mask four and then uh I'd, I'd do some of the moves and things um and uh they just you know they sat me down and said uh you know you're getting older so you know we'll see if we can do have you do something different and it's kind of like after i did the young lions cup which is kind of like their way of graduating from student to uh to uh to main level wrestler um after i did that tournament and i just went ahead with uh with a new direction so and of course, we're talking about. I don't think any of us mentioned it yet. Yeah, sorry, I forgot to mention the actual name. So it's the Puma gimmick that we're talking about. Um, now, what's interesting to me is is that's what you use when you work for TNA. Uh, now, since you had that, since that originated in New Japan, did you did, does TNA now own the rights to that, or how does that work? Um, I don't. I mean, I I, <laughs> I, I don't know if it, if there's something that was. Uh, done in New Japan or anything like that. As far as I know, it's just always been belonged to me at this point. I don't even know if you can copyright Puma. I think the shoe company might have a problem with that. So you you might be one of those rare guys who have managed to pull that off, who've gone to either TNA or WWE. And, you know, obviously TJ Perkins is your birth name. They can't have that. (laughs) But it seems like they can't have Puma either. So you're, you're okay on both ends. You use the name in other places with no issue, though, is what I'm getting at, correct? Yeah, yeah, I've used it everywhere. I mean, it's kind of been like, you know, Mysterio or or maybe Liger in the beginning for him, uh, for me. So, like, it just kind of, it's been, <laughs> it's kind of just been stamped on me and wherever I go it comes to. So, so far, I've, it's never really been an issue or a problem or anything. Um, I think at this point, because of uh, all the creative avenues I've, I've taken it, um, I've been told that it basically would belong to me at this point. Um, so, well, that's good. Uh, it can't be that's, bad. Yeah, that's, that helps out that's a lot. Good. Um, so, what's, <laughs> so, what is your status in New Japan these days? I think you were in Best of the Super Juniors either last year or the year before, correct? Yeah, that's correct. Um, and I don't know well, if you've been back since. So, what what's kind of going on with that? Well, mostly right after that, I signed the contract Ring of Honor, and I was there for um, almost a couple of years, I guess. I don't know if I had started with them prior to going over to Japan, but uh, maybe a couple matches. But then, uh, so I was, more or less, I was uh, I was just kind of concentrating on doing as much as I can here, and I just bought a home here, so I was, you know, uh, trying to manage being a proper adult, which I was lucky enough to not have to do the first half of my career because <laughs> I wasn't one yet. Um, but uh, uh, now at this point, it, it's mostly just because they have so many wrestlers. Like I think with the ownership change, it kind of opened the floodgates for them to try to expand. So, And because the junior division is just always going to be secondary to the heavyweight division, um, you know, that's already a, a tough – a tough thing for juniors to have to deal with, and the fact that they have such an influx of juniors coming in now, um, you know, it's it's mostly just down to that. So uh, I don't know. Uh, so did the ownership change? Did the ownership change change anything for you, or do the wrestlers just deal with uh, Guido and Jado? How does that work? Um, I don't think it changes anything as far as like uh, like like I still communicate with new train office uh frequently uh, i it just i think it just changes uh you know the business structure obviously and um and uh you know i don't know like what their plans are as far as how they want to build i know from what i'm told they uh they kind of want to go big so um you know i, I don't know some product of their <laughs> investment plans and just led to a pretty heavy saturation, especially in the junior division. So, you know, you're you're a guy who's pretty much you, you've been inside a ring pretty much everywhere. Um, we're TNA, Ring of Honor. We talked about New Japan. We talked about Mexico, CMLL. Um, is it? But but your 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 stays don't tend to be very long. 
is that just your personality? Do you not like to overstay your welcome, or or why is it that you, um, you bounce all over the place so often? <laughs> Some of that is by design. Most of that is by design, actually. Um, uh, some of it is. I mean, like, if if I had it my way, then then I wish the New Japan Junior Division wasn't so um, so heavily saturated. I'd, I'd love to just be over there full time. Um, but uh, you know, so some some of it is just accidental or just by you know by circumstances. Uh, but a lot of it is by design. I just uh, I, I realized at a young age that my age was going to be beneficial to me. So. Um, you know, I see a lot of my peers, I mean, they kind of take a fast track. They don't learn a whole lot and they do whatever they can to be successful, you know, from a, uh, I guess you could say like a popularity standpoint. They want to become a trend really fast. Um, and then you also see a lot of young guys have short careers. I mean, I think there are some people that have come along after me and finished their career already. Right. Um, be- because they just kind of did everything there is to do from a public creative standpoint and then if they can't make the jump to you know mainstream level stuff which for me happened really early um, but for some people they'll do everything they can at, at a certain level and then they don't succeed at moving up or they're unwilling or their body's breaking down or whatever the case may be to me I just always figured you know I want to do this till I'm like 45 if I can so I got all the time in the world so to me my education was super important um, I just wanted to be the best wrestler I could be. I could care less if people were saying that I was super popular, having a great run in some place, or, oh, he's, he has great matches all the time. Like, I just wanted to have good matches everywhere that I could learn something. Um, because I knew that someday that, you know, if I continue to be lucky and keep my head down and work hard, that I could end up, you know, still in my 20s and have wrestled everywhere. And then the job becomes a lot easier because, you're not trying to check stuff off the bucket list. You're just trying to do everything efficiently and do what matters and, and apply what you've learned. So, um, and I'm still trying to learn. So a lot of that was just like, you know, I want to go to Japan and learn everything I can here. And then they gave us the opportunity to go see MLL if we wanted. And I jumped at that because it's like, well, I could stay in Japan. I might be junior champion by next year, but I could also spend a year in Mexico. And that doesn't come up every time, you know, for everyone. Mm-hmm. So I want to go there. So then, you know, you start to sacrifice certain career jumps that it's like, it's a nice thing to say that you had certain things, but I think the education I got in exchange for that was invaluable. So I, I um, think a lot of it was um, because of that. And I think one one interesting thing that, that kind of looking at your career and, and looking at the multiple times where you were at TNA, you sort of, we'll talk a little bit about that, is... How has TNA maybe in your mind changed since? I mean, you came there in 2004 when it was still kind of beginning. It was more of a, it, it had its initial, you know, kind of roster of people. And slowly but surely it sort of evolved. And you sort of been there a bunch of different times. You were there in 2004, I think 2007, even as far back as 2011, or 2013 as well. What, what, what has sort of been the difference in your mind since you've kind of been there in that entire evolutionary period of the company? Uh, you know, I, I think that they just, uh, so I first came in, you know, 2004 or so, and then, you know, and like you said, I bounced kind of back and forth. I'd come back in for a run and say, like, 2006 for a while, and then I'd be gone again. And then I'd come back in 2007 or 8, and then be gone again. And then I'd come back in, like, 2010 or 11 and be gone again. Um, every time i come back, it seemed like there would be a few new pieces. A lot of the core remains the same. To me, I think the big thing is that I could see that there's – They've been progressively learning to find their identity and how to really become, you know, a great mainstream company. And I think that it's, you know, I think a lot of people now, because, you know, like I was talking about earlier, the generations have changed with social media. Stuff moves so fast now. And people, I think, generally, the people, people are just impatient. (laughs) I think they think, oh, you know, they've been around so long and there aren't that many changes. But really, there are changes, and most companies take decades to get it right. And I think that it's been a pretty decent uh, progression on their part to learn how to manage live TV. And now they're taking live TV on a traveling schedule. And then there was a time when I was there, I was on the first ever 
pay-per-view they did and at that time and then soon after that they started having live event loops and things like that and I think that they've uh they've started to become uh more efficient at doing all of those next level things that a mainstream company needs to do um and that's really been the big difference to me is that they've kept the core they've changed out certain pieces as far as the roster and people and people in the office and things like that over the years but they've progressively started to understand what is going to be asked of them to, you know, be a company at that level. Um, that's really been the only difference. You know, and, and they keep calling you back, so they obviously like you. But if they offered <laughs> you if they offered you a full time spot, would you take it? And, and before you answer, the reason I ask that is I've talked to people both off the record and on the record who, who have told me, some people who said that they won't take TNA full-time, and, and their reasons vary. Some feel they can do better on their own on the independent scene money-wise. Some feel that there's sort of a TNA stigma if the goal is to get to WWE. But would you take a full-time spot if they offered it, and if not, why? Oh, uh, absolutely. I mean, I don't see why there's any reason why you, why you shouldn't, generally speaking, I think... In a case by case scenario, I'm, I, uh, I'm certain because I've seen it in certain guys that they, uh, they know what they're doing and, and they might think otherwise. But, uh, but to me, I mean, it's, uh, you know, if you're doing this and the goal is always to get to a major league level and there's not that much of that nowadays, um, you know, TNA now is what you know, WCW was for young wrestlers when I first started. Uh, WWE will always exist. Uh, New Japan is and probably always will be you know, a big mainstream entity as far as being a major league level place to go. Uh, Ring of Honor is trying really hard to continue their transition. Um, but you know, there's really just not that many places to go. It's, it's, uh, you know, like Shawn Michaels talked about it in his like documentary thing where when, you know, they went back to AWA and then they realized that with the way that you know, the world was changing. There's just not many places for them to go. So they ended up back in, in the WWF. And I think wrestling, you know, goes through those changes and it's now back to a point like that where, I mean, you could go on your own and in a case by case way, like for me, I, my, my life operates just fine if, if I'm continue to be freelance. Um, that's no problem for me. Not everybody's in the same boat. Uh, but for me, I would take it just, because it's a great place to work, and uh, I don't know about other people, but for me, I don't always enjoy being my own boss. <laughs> like, uh, it's, it's really stressful after a while. Like people, people tell me like, oh, I envy you, I envy you. You don't have to answer to anybody. But to be honest, like after 14, 15 years of wrestling, now I just, I mean, I've never had any other job but this, and it's like the hustle you have to put into being your own entity when you're not part of New Japan, when you're not part of a Ring of Honor, when you're not somewhere like where somebody's, you know, you're working in a system, the the amount of mental stress that goes into that is just terrible. Like, I can't, I hate it. <laughs> so, Interesting. Uh, so I would love the monotony of, of just living out of a suitcase, which, I mean, I kind of do anyway, but, like, I would love to be able to be told, okay, Here's the times, here's where you go, see you later. Like, great, because that's more mental energy I could put into training, eating right, and being a good, you know, family person. So Right, right. Now, something interesting I picked up on in that answer was um, you had mentioned that you don't need that because you're doing well as a freelancer. And, and you mentioned earlier as well that you've purchased a home, and you're obviously doing pretty okay for yourself. In the current climate, 2013, how many guys on the independent scene or, or, or who are freelancing do you think are able to sustain themselves at a livable level at this point? Honestly, I, I couldn't tell you. But I I do think, and I, I didn't really think about this in in uh, in a whole lot of detail until recently, that it's really just a people thing. I mean, it's not, it's not a wrestling thing. It's not anything like that. It's really like a human thing question because like there are people who could be doctors and they just do not manage their lives very well and they can't handle it i mean there's athletes that go broke you know playing major sports it's like how, how could you like could you fathom being a 30 million dollar guy and being broke like i i can't it's crazy but i just think 
you know, like, I just think that, uh, and then meanwhile, you see people that, like, you see single mothers who work a minimum wage job, and they are able to pull it off. Um, and I just think that it just comes down to the person. I mean, if you're motivated to succeed and you know how to handle your life, then, I mean, independent wrestling isn't such a bad thing, but you got to put in the work to make it work. It's just no different than any other job or career. I think that more people could do it if they tried, but I think a lot of people just expect things to come to them. And for me, I mean, like, the only reason I have this is because I've had much, much worse. I mean, I've been, I've been homeless and starving and collecting coins to eat in the middle of the night at Target in the parking lot. I mean, I've had that. So it kind of educated me on how to prioritize, like, what do I need in my life? What do I want? How do I make it work? Not how do I be like other people, not how do I get what other people have, but how do I make my own situation work? Like, what are the exact numbers I need to do what I want? So I just think more people need to see it like that. Yeah, but for a top level indie guy like you, there there is enough money out there to be made to to, to live a normal life. I mean, I I heard uh, I don't remember if it was Nick Jackson or Matt. It was one of the Young Bucks, and they did an interview with Brian Alvarez, and you know they had mentioned that they were you know bought a home in Southern California now, and they're not so sure they'd even want to move to Florida at this point. Um, if the <laughs> yeah. calls, uh, you know, it's and and you know so uh, so I guess what I'm getting at is for for guys who don't have trouble getting bookings, there is. It, it's 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 not the destitute lifestyle a lot of people think it is. Yeah, I mean, it really doesn't have to be. It's it's just up to the person. You got to you have to put in the work. Um, I think that I mean, like, I'm not a rich man, but I have my own home and I own my own car and a nice car and <laughs> and I live in Southern <laughs> California, which is a pretty pretty nice. You're doing okay already. Yeah, before the before the yeah, house and the car, you're already doing okay. So. Yeah, I mean, I. I I uh, I do okay, and I think that maybe it's a good example for me because I'm not really big on self promotion. Like I, I'm not a trendy guy. I don't try to be a trendy. I, I've always kind of ran from it, as you guys have kind of pointed out already. I, I bounce around a lot, and I don't chase that. So there are guys who are much more popular than me, and and are really great at their job, and they're working at at the independent level, and and they have the opportunity to do tenfold what I'm doing because I'm not, you know. I, I'm not that proactive socially, and um, and I'm able to do it just simply by you know being smart and being a good businessman. I just think that a lot of people aren't willing to put in that work. Uh, well, one promotion I wanted to talk about a lot. The first thing when I knew we were having you on and. and... Wrestling Society X. What was that whole situation like working for them? Because it's a very, it's probably the most unique promotion you've ever worked for. Was it all that much different, kind of backstage for you guys or for the wrestlers, or was it pretty unique in that sense as well? Because I mean, it came across on TV, obviously, as a completely different experience. But I was kind of wondered in ring how much different it was for you guys. Uh, you know, I mean, it was just exactly the same as being anywhere else, as far as I was concerned. I mean, my job was exactly the same. Uh, but when I say exactly the same, I mean uh, in, in being in, like, a mainstream environment. Like, when you're working with television and that type of uh, production, the way that it comes out in the end oftentimes uh, changes drastically the way that they dress it up in editing and all that. But as far as us, the the professional lifestyle is the same. I mean, hurry up and wait and <laughs> time cues and cameras in your face and faceless people jerking you left and right and... And, you know, like, it's not as organic as doing a live show somewhere and just going out and just letting it all hang out in the rain. Um, but doing the job uh, is the same as any other job as far as mainstream wrestling goes. It just felt the same as being at TNA or being at WWE and doing, you know, a, a SmackDown match or something like that. Uh, just the <laughs> the char- the real-life characters were a little different. <laughs> uh as is most uh, uh, Mass Republic production things, but um, but uh, the wrestling just felt the same. I mean, I don't know. To me, once I get in there, it's just you know, like throw Peyton Manning on any football field, he'll he'll run the no huddle no matter what. So to me, it's just get get me in a ring and I'll wrestle. You know, I I know how to make it work out, um, which is why my education was always so important to me. So. 
So I, I know, yeah, as you mentioned, Wrestling Society X, it wasn't too big of a transition for you guys in ring. One thing that was pretty interesting, though, was how the ca- sort of cancellation of the show and all that sort of stuff. Did that affect you guys, or did you guys get paid already and everything was okay? Because I know you, they aired, I think, three or four episodes. Then they kind of said, oh, crap, you know, I think somebody threw a fireball at somebody, and they said, okay, you know, we can't have this on the air. And then they aired all the <laughs> other episodes, and they said, okay, no, you're never going to see it ever again or whatever. Were you guys still good, though? Or um, were you, were you, was it kind of you guys, when you did your tapings, you got paid then, and then you were fine? Or how did that sort of work out? Because I remember at that time, I went, man, there's a lot of really cool guys in here, and I hope they got paid because – yeah, that roster was awesome. It was filled with great guys <laughs> um, at the time. You know, I don't, I don't know for everybody else, but I mean, for me, it was a little different because I did, uh, I had, uh, wrestled on the pilot and then I had wrestled a handful of matches, maybe one or two more, I guess. And, uh, I don't know when they would have aired, but I actually, I didn't stay through the, the whole season. And, um, there's some guys that were there that left immediately. Um, they didn't even stay, they didn't even wrestle on the pilot. They they uh, had other stuff that came up, um, uh, uh, like uh, you know, like something like uh, like opportunities to wrestle somewhere else or something like that, like like WWE or something like that. I, I I think at the time Evan Bourne almost didn't even wrestle because there was something on the table for him, but he went ahead with it, and uh, you know, obviously now we know where he ended up. Um, I like some. I, as far as I know, like guys that I was friends with and kept, you know, tabs on how everything was going. They, uh, they ended up making pretty good money, and so everything, I guess, was fine. I don't recall anybody having any problems with it, as far as that goes. Uh, but I don't even remember how that went about, as far as uh, the uh, cancellation and when it, when everything went down, just because uh, I wasn't there. Mm-hmm. Now, was there a contract required to participate in that that precluded people from looking into other things, or was there an out if you know you got an offer from someplace bigger? I think there there probably was for guys, and pro- I'm sure there was uh, for me because I uh, I kind of informed them up front that I might not be staying through the whole project, and I don't think that there was a huge role for me to play there anyway. Um, but uh so I didn't really I didn't have to go through anything. I I, I signed like a day contract or something like that. Um but uh I, I don't I'm sure that for other guys they had probably stuff that included, you know, their work through the season. Um uh, much like, you know, when I wrestled for for M T V for Lucha Libre USA was just uh you know, there's certain certain things that guys signed before they take on a like a season's worth of work. Right, right. Um now speaking of national T V What a lot of people may not realize is that you did appear on WWE TV a couple of times, and I think right around that time – I'm not sure if I have my timeline right, but I'm sure you'll correct me if I'm off. You also did uh, camp in FCW as well. I think it would be interesting for the listeners if you can talk us through that and what it's like being at a taping and and, uh, who you deal with. uh, you know Who books you for something like that and then also what goes on at at a FCW tryout camp. So, um, uh, so the camp that I did for FCW, I'll start with that because it's more easy. To, <laughs> uh, the camp I did was in, at, was not actually a tryout camp. It's just a steady camp that they hold for a certain while and then it ends and they restart it again. And it's basically a night version of their day camp, which is the regular developmental practice. And, um, some of the guys from, from the contracted camp, uh, also go to the to the evening camp, and it's not really a tryout camp. It's just everything that the guys do during the day is the same thing that the people at night do. The only difference is the daytime guys are all under contract, the nighttime guys are all freelance, and you know maybe they they will be or they won't be, um, or they're guys that just want to get at it. They need to get extra work in, um, and then they do have those tryout camps that are like real short. I mean, like only several days long. Um, so that was that for me. Uh, I was there for the, for the evening camp, which was just, <laughs> uh, a monotonous, uh, tedious, like same thing they go through, um, during the day. Uh, so is that, is that, day, so I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yeah. Is that something you're invited no, to? Is that something you're invited to or something where you pay to participate just to have the eyes on you? How does that work? Uh, some guys are invited. Some guys, uh, sign up, uh, just as if, you know, same as if you'd never wrestled before, just going to the gym for the first time, like you would in Ohio Valley or, 
any other place. Um, I, it, in in a lot of ways, it's actually exactly like the the regular camp for the contracted guys because the contracted guys are both veteran wrestlers who were who were given the opportunity, and some of them are have never touched a ring in their life. <laughs> it's almost the exact right, right. same mm-hmm. with people. <laughs> um, and actually, when I went down there, um, I had done in addition to the 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 things that I'd done on television already, I'd done like half a dozen dark matches and tryout matches at TV already. And it was getting to where like, um, they all came in such a short amount of time, uh, just by happenstance. Like they did two West coast loops really close together, which almost never happens. Um, and then I also happened to be in a part of the country already where they were doing more stuff. So then I was there again and they happened to do two long weekends where they had like three tapings because of an international tour. So they had to, add in an extra day so I was there for an extra day so it just happened to be that I was I had done a lot of stuff at TV and it was getting to the point that there were some people there that just I think they assumed that I was already under WWE contract <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, were, they were seeing me at TV every week um, and I remember there was one time in between loops where it was right before a pay-per-view in LA I think and uh, uh, Shawn Michaels came to the gym out here where I started and just to make an appearance and address like the students there. And I, I had just gotten back, I guess, same as him from TV and I was home for like a day and I was like, well, I'm going to go in the gym and get some work in. So I was getting work in and then he came in and made an appearance. I didn't know he was going to be there. And then he uh, was kind of giving these guys like a speech and stuff and talking to them. I'm sitting in the back of the room and he stops in the middle. He he points at me. He's like, "Hey, weren't you at TV this week?" <laughs> and so what the hell are like, you doing uh, here? <laughs> yeah, like, um, so it's it's it was getting like that. So then uh, some of the some of the agents said I knew like I think Tommy Dreamer was the first guy to pull me aside and say this. He was there at the time, and he was like, "You know, you you kind of hit like a glass wall here because you're doing all this stuff here, and everybody knows you're a really great wrestler, but you know you're." You're undersized, generally speaking, and and to be honest, like in an environment like this, I mean, the really important people here are very concerned that John Cena has everything he needs for today. Like, it's, it's not it's not really going to be your your platform here. So maybe since you've done all you can here, you know, it's kind of one of those things where the company is so big, the left hand doesn't know what the right hand's doing. So he's like, maybe you try another outlet and go down to the training center and, and go there and see if uh, see if um, you could find another avenue to pursue. So that's what I did. Um, but I went down and I didn't, I didn't want to, I guess, defeat myself. <laughs> so I felt like I didn't want to go in saying like, well, I'm this guy and I'm so great. And I came, I was told to come down here. So I actually went down to SCW as if I had never wrestled before. Like I didn't tell anybody I was a wrestler. I didn't, say that I was told to go there. I just, I wanted to have a complete blank slate and let them decide for themselves what they think of me. Um, you know, I didn't want to come down with baggage at all. Uh, so that's what I did. I just went down as if, as if I had never wrestled, did it all on my own. And, um, but a lot of people were, were kind of weirded out by that. Like, why wouldn't you want to be like proud of your experience? But it's like, there's sometimes when, I don't know, I guess you can take, uh, you have an opportunity to take several steps forward if you maybe take a couple back, so. And it's also, um, let's be honest, there is a bit of an odd culture in that company, and, you know, saying or doing the wrong thing can really put you behind the eight ball. Um, Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and and why don't you kind of speak to that? When you're doing these dark match tryouts, Maybe not so much by the fifth or sixth one, <laughs> but when you're doing your first or second one, <laughs> is the air just really thick when you get in the building? Are you, are you living in fear that you're going to forget to shake somebody's hand or eat from the wrong catering table? I mean, is, is there that, you know, because, you know, there's just that stigma, and it's not really a stigma, it's a reality that one slight misstep can just bury you in that place. Is, is, do you have that feeling when you walk in the building? <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. There's so many stories that are like that. I'll try to recall some of the few short instances, but I mean, so, okay, like you were asking before, like your typical day when you go and, and, uh, and, uh, you're doing work like this. So, I mean, they have, uh, they have a talent office just like any other major company and, and, um, 
and they'll contact you and give you the basic info, the dates and times and all that, and give you, you know, your rundown and everything, and then and then you show up. And so, I mean, every part of it is going to be uncomfortable. I mean, you drive to this arena, and you don't even know, how, like, what parking lot you're supposed to enter <laughs> from. You don't know what tunnel you're supposed to go to. You end up parking where normal people park, and you realize you have to walk a football field length of of crap just to get to where you're supposed to go. And then when you get there, you have to check in with like 18 different people to prove that you're supposed to be in the building. And then you go in and, and, uh, just like how, uh, just like how it is in beyond the mat and stuff like that. Like, you, you know, you see those printouts of, you know, catering arrow this way and locker room arrow this way and TV <laughs> media station arrow this way. And, Seamstress, this way, Vince's office, this way, all that is real. That's legitimate. That's not part of like, like, uh, the documentary or anything. That's really how it is. You walk in the tunnel, you see that tree of printouts, and you just find the arrow that belongs to you, and you go there. And, <laughs> and then it's just like with any other TV thing, you know, hurry up and wait. I mean, you, you're struggling to get there on time and check in with the person you're supposed to check in with. There's usually some sort of agent that will tell you, okay, you need to check in with here so they know you're there. You're worried about being on time and finding that person and finding your locker room, and then you sit for several hours because <laughs> that's just how it is. And then, uh, uh, you know, they, they'll get the ring set up, and guys, just like in like the NBA, they go out for the pregame shoot-around, and guys go down and, and work out and stretch out and, and uh, you know, just clear their head and warm up, and, and uh, guys will go down there. Sometimes they... They assess you as far as your skills and stuff like that. Um, it seems like oftentimes I was uh, being tabbed to, like, help other people, which was bizarre to me. Like, um, I think, like, Arn Anderson one time asked me to help Morrison and Bourne, Evan Bourne, I think, come up with a come up with a move or something. <laughs> that, <laughs> no, pay me. Like, yeah, no, were, just, they just give me. They're working. They, they were trying to work on something, and, and, and I was asked to help them. And then, uh, and then there was uh, another time when I think it was Norman Smiley, who at the time already knew me very well because uh, because I had been in FCW for a while, um, asked me to take a group of the divas and see if I could help them. And so it was, it was really – sometimes it, it works like that. It's weird. And then uh, um, there's been a few times where I just wanted to go in and freestyle it with – my friends, I'll go in and just start wrestling, you know, uh, TJ Wilson or, or, uh, Jamie Noble and, and then, uh, and, you know, the whole roster will gather around the ring and watch it. It's kind of nerve wracking, but it's cool, I guess. And uh, it's just, it's a different experience every time. And then, uh, like you said, I mean, there's all kinds of weird things where you feel like you're walking on eggshells. You worry if you're dressed right, you know, you worry about, you know, forgetting to say hello to certain people. And then here's, here's like the worst ever situation is you, you're walking by Triple H and he's on his cell phone. Do you shake his hand or do you not? Are you a jerk <laughs> if you don't? Like, do you say hi? Do you wave? What do you right. do? Like, right. Like, if you, you, do you interrupt him when he's trying to say goodbye to his kids or is he just trying to order a pizza and it's no big deal? Like, you don't know. Like, and there's no answer to that. And then, <laughs> that's uh, tough. That's yeah. not, that, that probably wouldn't work out too well. <laughs> and then, you know, people watch replays of of stuff on the monitor and they have seats set up for people to sit around. And it's like, do you sit down or do you not? Are you standing in a place where somebody can't see? Did you just sit in Ric Flair's chair? You don't know. Um, it really you know, is crazy. A lot yeah. Of, yeah, yeah, there's a lot of stuff like that. I remember there was one time when, uh, uh, you know, we were done and um, with uh, the day part and uh, – we went back to the locker room, a uh, group of us, and we're changing, uh, and the show's going to begin, or maybe it had just begun, and and uh, Mark Henry came back and basically kicked the door and was yelling at us, like, you know, why are you guys so ungrateful? You should be watching and, and learning and and seeing the, the 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 live, you know, replay on the on the monitor like everybody else. And it's like we were told to come back here and change so that we can go do, you know, like. I mean, there's just stuff like that happens all the time where it's like, you, you know, can't I, win. I, yeah. You can't win. And so, uh, and then it's weird because like the harder you try sometimes, I mean, there's times where you try really hard to do all the right things. Oh, then you get in trouble for that. Like, I, yeah. 
Yeah, DDP yeah, I mean, got, like, still gets made fun of for hugging Vince McMahon once. I mean, they, they still do angles now <laughs> where they make fun of hugging for the sole purpose because he was so grateful to get his job that he hugged him. But no, can't do that either. Cause it's a, yeah, it, it's just, <laughs> you never know. Well, I mean, like, for me, like, I'm a guy that, that, uh, like, I am like a soldier for wrestling. I mean, ever since I began, I was deathly afraid of not doing, not doing it right. And so I've always done everything I've been told, like, not 90%, not 95%, like 100%, like everything. I mean, you tell me to eat a certain way, act a certain way, stand a certain way, dress a certain way, I've always done it. And so, like, in this situation, it's like, like, I don't know that there's too many people out there that could try and pull off any harder than I can to, to do everything right. And it's like, Murphy's law, everything will go wrong. And, and that happens that way. And then there, there have been times when, when I purposely disregarded most things. And then it, it's, it, I got all the bounces. I mean, there were times when I showed up and didn't even bring gear with me. And, and they, they insisted that I wrestle multiple matches. And, and okay, I don't have gear. Okay, we're going to make you gear. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then it's like, all right, be by the ring for the, for the workout. And, you know, I don't have gear, so I don't go down there. And they come find me, like, hey, we need you to help out with this. It's like, most people get kicked out of the building for acting like that. So sometimes, sometimes you do everything wrong and, and you can't, you couldn't be a better person to them. And sometimes you do everything right and they couldn't care less. It's just, and it, there's never constant. Sometimes they love it when you do everything right. It's just, it's it's it is right. very 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 hard place to to be in. So when when you have a dark match like that, is it and it's a tryout? It, I, now you said you had several. Um, were these against other guys trying out? Do they stick you in there with somebody from the roster you're familiar with? Do they try to go out of their way like that, or is it just completely random? Uh, sometimes yes, sometimes no. Like there's sometimes when you're with, it is very random. Um, there are sometimes when you're you're wrestling with uh you know other people that are there that are freelance guys sometimes you're wrestling somebody that needs a tune up and sometimes you're wrestling somebody cuz they're being groomed you know for uh you're basically their tomato can so to speak and uh um sometimes it's all about you sometimes they just have you wrestle just have you wrestle i remember one time they the, they had Sema from Dragon Gate at Raw and they weren't interested in having him as part of the company. I don't think Sema cared about him being part of the company, but he <laughs> right, just happened right. to be there. And they 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 had him. And they put him in a match before the show started. He wrestled Jamie Noble. They had a great little match, and it's like, and, and it's you know Jamie Noble isn't a regular competitor, and right. so it's like, it's not like he was a soup can for Jamie. It's not like they're taking a look at Sema or assessing him. They just put the match out there. Sometimes it happens that randomly. <laughs> so when when you complete a tryout match and you and now are these always in front of fans or sometimes these are before the doors open? Uh both. I mean like uh like the the Sema match, I was uh like right before the opening match of Raw before they turned the cameras on. So the whole arena is full. Oh wow. Um and then and then sometimes yeah, like I mean they they weren't wrestling in like Nikes or anything. Um, and then, uh, you know, they do have, you know, um, empty arena matches where it's just like nobody watching sometimes. Like I've had a few where the whole roster is just sitting around watching, which is worse than the arena actually. Right. Right. <laughs> I would, right. I would rather, yeah, I'd rather wrestle in front of 20,000 people at Staples yeah. Center, <laughs> like as opposed to the 30 guys who have been world champions and like, are you know have a great career and they're just staring at you from eight feet away like i'd right. rather have the, the first but uh, you get both and um and they happen at random and, and and then there's some stuff that's weird like uh tyson kidd i was supposed to be his debut opponent it wasn't literally until they were about to play his music that they decided to swap me out for somebody else um so there's some stuff that that changes like that, like just in a heartbeat, everything changes. So it's it's really crazy. So when you finish your match and you go to, I assume there's an agent for the match, like any other match. Do do they assess you right there? Do they tell you don't call us, we'll call you? How does it work from there? <laughs> uh, usually, you you kind of see somebody immediately. Um, and uh, prior to going out, I mean that's 
an, another eggshell process in and of itself because, uh, you know, you have this long tunnel with a billion really important people as you walk through the tunnel at various stations doing various things. And then uh, there's like a checklist before you go out. Like, it's not just as simple as going on wrestling or going out and wrestling for, you know, a certain time limit. Like, you know, you're not allowed to chew gum sometimes. You're not allowed to have any water or oil on you sometimes. You're not allowed to have your hair parted a certain way sometimes you're not allowed to wear wrist tape certain times um I, I wasn't allowed to wear a neck i couldn't wear a necklace i had to take it off i had to spit my gum out like uh, they have a lot of wow. there's a billion rules you know and it's i mean I, it's probably the same way as it is in like any other professional sport where they're like you know this is your dress like michael jordan got fined what like five grand every time he wore his yeah. Nikes his rookie year because they violated the dress code and it's like they were they were the team colors but it was just that finite of a rule um, so it's it's just like that with any other television or production or entertainment thing where they say like look you know we're, we're not having gum now or we're not having this or that or no hair gel it's like <laughs> oh, wow okay <laughs> fair enough whatever <laughs> yeah. so yeah. I, I know one thing we we, we not to kind of get off the, the wrestling just yet, but I know we, when we had you on, we said we, we're get, we have to talk a little of NBA. We got to talk NBA. Big NBA yeah, fan? Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. So what are your thoughts so far on the playoffs? And, and maybe who, who do you um, who do you see emerging from the West? Because I think we have a pretty decent idea from the East, unless, of course, you think the Pacers. But Well, I mean, it, it's it's gone pretty predictably so far, I think. Um, yeah, I think everybody just takes – I mean, Miami's such a good team, so everybody – Everybody's pretty sure that they they would uh, win out in the end, uh, myself included. Um, I'm kind of surprised that the Knicks didn't make the conference finals in the East. Um, as far as the West goes, um, I think it's pretty predictable. I mean, I kind of thought that San Antonio would end up in the NBA Finals, to be honest. Um, I think Memphis, I thought Memphis was going to finish higher than they did. I thought from the beginning of the season that, they might be a conference final team, which, I, you know, they are, but, um, and then I don't think anybody saw, you know, Westbrook going down, obviously. No, I don't think people saw everyone. that. I mean, I think it's crazy to, to think that, like, I mean, who would have thought that the real, like, MVP of any team was Westbrook this whole time? I mean, he went down and changed the landscape of everything. I mean, what other player could you think of going down and their team would struggle that bad immediately? <laughs> I mean, if if Wade or LeBron went down, Miami would probably still win out in any series. I mean, the Bulls were missing tons of people, and they were still able to compete. I mean, yeah, Indiana such an evenly. Yeah, I just I mean, if Harden went down, Houston probably struggled quite a bit. I mean, I think to a lesser extent, if Tony Parker went down, the Spurs would struggle maybe a little bit less than say Houston would. But I mean, Westbrook going down, and it's like, wow. I mean, that he was like driving the team. Right, nobody, they were just running around with, their, with their heads cut off. They, they had no plays, yeah. nothing. They looked like they <laughs> everybody looked like they hadn't. I think, I mean, Westford going down and seeing what happened with Oklahoma, and then if people think about what happened with Derrick Rose previously, I think it gives, like, new credence to, the like, the one guy that wouldn't vote for LeBron in the MVP race. Like, like I think it brings a lot of validity to his points that, like, there are some people on teams when – you consider them maybe the player of the year. Like, if they had a player of the year award, LeBron wins hands down. Yeah, I they, mean, they should almost change the award. I think that's that's one of my one of my issues is there's always that, that that word value always becomes an issue because if it's yeah if it's best player then it's Michael Jordan wins it until he retires and then Shaq and Kobe and then you know and then LeBron is exactly for the yeah. next nine years and will win it for the next five or whatever and then but the value makes it a little bit different that 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 word always kind of. Yeah, I mean, it completely changes everything. And the original criteria for the award was always, you know, value to your team. So, like, where would your team be without you? Um, like the like when Jerry West won the finals MVP and uh, Russell defended it, he said he should have won. And they're like, well, the Lakers lost and West wasn't the best player on the court. And he goes, you don't understand. The Lakers would not have been in the finals if not for Jerry West. They they wouldn't they wouldn't have even been in contention to win that series without Jerry West. It doesn't matter if he lost or if his numbers were low. His value to his team was greater than anybody else. Um, I just think that, you know, after Jordan, because he's such a marketable guy, the business of basketball or just sports has changed. So now it's 
it's really not about that. I <laughs> just, you know, whoever, whoever looks great on paper will get it. Um, but I mean, to be realistic, I just, most of the guys that were finalists in the MVP race, you take them off that team and their team is still in the playoffs. But there's some guys like take Harden off Houston, the Rockets are a basement team. Um, if you took Kobe off the Lakers, they'd be 14th in the West or whatever. Like, I mean, <laughs> it's just, there's some guys that their value to the team, it, it has no bearing on the numbers. Uh, somebody brought it up in the NHL actually about uh, Ovechkin being in the MVP race for the NHL. And they said, well, how, you know, how could you give it to this guy? He played, he was terrible half the year. But while he was terrible, the Washington Capitals were the last place team in the league. When he heated up, he ended up finishing first in the scoring race and putting up great numbers and the Capitals finished third in the conference as opposed to being the last place overall in the league and it's like people get mad and it's like uh, you know you can't give an MVP to a guy that performs bad sometimes but it's like their value is directly connected to that team and that's evidence of it if they perform bad the team performs bad if they perform good the team performs good so obviously they're the most valuable to the team it doesn't matter if they're the best player that's not the point you know yeah, and you know, the bottom line is, is not just for the NBA or the NHL, but all these leagues, they're never taking the word valuable out of that award because they like the fact that we're arguing about this. And, and yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, they, they like the fact that writers write about it and people talk about it, and, it, you know, it gets them free press. So yeah. the word valuable, they like that little wrench in there. Whether that was the original intention or not, that's never going to change. Um, and I, th- I mean, with every passing year, like, the, it's, I think this the the award itself in pretty much any league, mostly the NBA, I would say, than any other sport, really loses its meaning just because it's a voting process and all the voters are in some way like correlated to the league. I mean, just like the analysts for third party like television stations are, you know, in some way correlated to the league, like they're indirectly on the payroll, so to speak, and it's like, it's a group effort to promote, basically, is what it is, right. so, I mean, that's that's their way of making sure that they're selling jerseys and promoting certain guys, I mean, like, like look at Kobe, I mean, as soon as he had that, that uh, um, scandal in 2004, he was in no race for <laughs> MVPs, he wasn't on anybody's poster, but... Like, he was clearly probably the best player in the league for the rest of the decade until now. And it's like, how did he all of a sudden disappear from all these races? But it's like, you know, nobody wants to market a guy like that. So It's not just wrestling where they work angles. So you Oh, know, no, it's, definitely it's, not. <laughs> everything's a <gonna> work <laughs> in some respect. Uh, let's circle back to wrestling. I actually have – I want to make sure I get to some of these listener questions. Um, yeah. Because without – yeah, you know, without them, there's no show. Uh, we've got one from Rob Stryker, who's an original, who's a uh, actually a frequent listener here, and he's got an interesting question. He says, "I'm a huge fan of Gabe Sapolsky and think he's a great booker. Why is there a rift between the two of you?" And quickly before you answer that, for the people who have no idea what Rob Stryker's talking about, um, after Brian Danielson left for WWE and. Davy Richards uh, signed his deal with Ring of Honor. Um, you were sort of earmarked to be the face of Evolve, uh, you know, in the early days. And you worked a couple of shows for Evolve and Dragon Gate USA. And then you were just gone. And, um, you know, whenever asked about it, Gabe, you know, and I'm paraphrasing, I don't want to put words in his mouth, always says something to the fact of, well, I don't know what happened. I'd love to work with him. You'd have to ask TJ what the issue is. And, um, I, I kind of suspect what you're going to say because I, you know, I follow things like this. But for the benefit of the listeners, why don't you go ahead and explain what happened between you and Gabe Sapolsky? Well, m- more or less, it really just kind of came down to to a business thing. Um, uh, everything you said was pretty accurate. I uh, came in at the, you know, when Evolve was born, and um, and uh, even before Davey left, I was kind of positioned as sort of a uh, I was kind of like the Kobe to Davies Shaq, kind of, in the whole umbrella that they have there, not just in Evolve, but in Dragon Gate USA as well. Um, and uh, and so when Davey left, which I actually saw coming longer, way longer before it happened, just because Davey's a good friend of mine, and uh, I, I, just, I knew the decisions that were on his plate. Um, so when it happened and, and I was tapped to do that, um, you know, that's all accurate. Um, I don't have uh, 
any creative or personal problems at all with the guys at Dragon Gate or Gabe or anything like that. Um, it just kind of came down to I was struggling a lot in Florida, and and I basically had restarted my career and had a second career basically born from all that. And then, uh, uh, and I got an offer from MTV for their first season, and I uh, signed it and was able to move home. And and then I saved up some money from uh, also doing a bunch of WWE dark matches and things like that, and like the SmackDown matches, which is weird because I was at FCW and couldn't get anything. <laughs> and then all of a sudden that kind of came afterward. And then I started going back to Japan because I didn't have to dedicate all my time domestically to. Uh, to FCW, so I went over for like IGF and went over to Europe and went to Mexico because now the the doors were open on my schedule. And with all that going on and my career back in place and moving home, it just I you know explained that uh that uh more or less he would just have to do better business with me because I was basically uh I was basically working for nothing. And uh, he took it really cool at the time that I had said it. He said that he, he feels bad that they wish they could do better and he'd like to have me again in the future. And I said, that's great, and, and I'd love to be back. All those guys are friends of mine, and they still are. And uh, and then I think he was upset that the public learned that they didn't want to invest in me. So it wasn't a question of me like not wanting to be there, but he didn't want to invest what I was worth, you know, to them. So, so if, if upset. so, it's not a per, there's no personal problem. It's well, I think he took it personally, but I don't know that. I think maybe now, as time has gone on, maybe he realized that. I mean, I don't know because I haven't spoken to him, but I don't think he really had a reason to take it personally. He just may have overreacted at the time. Um, Gabe's temperamental with fans. Like, he uh, he gets worried about his image a lot, um, which, for me, on the flip side, I'm so opposite of that because, like I said before, like, I, I, uh, I've i never tried to be in favor of a trend or anything like that or be popular. But just like if you wake up in the morning and turn on Sports Center, it's like, okay, Manny Ramirez signed as a free agent with the Dodgers because they made him a better offer. Like, the Boston Red Sox wouldn't flip out and say, well, how could you say that? That's not supposed to be public, but it's like, that's the truth. You know, they didn't, they didn't want to pay him the same and, and he got a better offer and he went with that. Um, so you're an out, so and, basically you're an outspoken guy. And when people like me ask you this question, you answer it straight. And he didn't appreciate that at first. You don't think, and you think that kind of exasperated yeah, I, this, I, made it bigger than it is. I think all it really came down to is that, Gabe prides himself on being the guy, like at the indie level, that Gabe always gives the people what they want. So in this case, people are going to look at it and say, well, the, the only reason TJ is not there is because Gabe doesn't see enough in him to, to, to keep him. So Gabe didn't want that being like a black mark on him, like, like he's the bad guy. So he got mad, I think, because of that. Um, he didn't want people to know, which, I mean, I can understand completely where he's coming from, but he, I think he, and not just him, but, you know, people in the administrative positions anywhere in the wrestling world need to understand the wrestler's side of it, especially when we're freelance guys, which at the time I had a contract, so I was okay, but, like, us as freelancers, it it's hard for us to take, to be holding the bag, too, when, when uh, somebody doesn't want to invest, but people want them on the show, like, I went through the same thing with Ring of Honor. People wanted me to be on TV all the time, but they didn't want to invest as much as with other things that they wanted to do. So, you know, in that situation, the administration doesn't want to be the one holding the bag. They want the, the talent to be like smile and wave and say, well, you guys will see me eventually, but it's like to us, eventually we look like we're not worth it. So that hurts us. So I just thought, like any other athlete in any other sport, I mean, that's just realistic. I mean, I didn't think anybody should take it personally. But I could see where he's coming from because he doesn't want to be seen as that guy that doesn't want to give the people what they want. Um, right. You don't, you, don't, you don't see it as dirty laundry, and maybe he does. Is that kind of the gist of it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I think as time has gone on, he's, I don't think he has any, really any ill will towards me. I mean, he's 
since complimented me as far as what people have told me. They said that he still thinks the world of my work and he wishes he could have done more. And I think I even uh, sent him a message when somebody had told me he said that. And I, I said, I really appreciate that. That's really awesome. He's always surrounded by great guys. Obviously, he's a good entity in the wrestling world. I just... Um, I think at the time, maybe he was just a little overwhelmed, and he's a temperamental guy, and a lot of people are, and I just think that's how he saw it. He didn't want to look like the bad guy. Right. If he called you tomorrow, would there would you be open to a dialogue? Oh, absolutely. I There's never been a time when I wasn't. Okay. So it was basically just, let, let, it was a money issue. Mm-hmm. Completely okay. business. That's all it was. 100% business. Um now, as far as your latest Ring of Honor run, I, that you know that was probably the place you stayed the longest, the longest sustained run you've had. I think that was about 15 months. Um, there was a rumor that circulated that because you took a TNA tryout, that's why they released you from your contract. Did you want to set the record straight on that? Oh, I didn't even know that that's what people – well, I don't well, know. Well, I guess people, I'm exposing you to a new rumor. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I should, I should, I should, uh, I, I should set this as a footnote. I, I don't read it anything wrestling related on the internet it's just always been right. like uh it's always been like the golden rule of mine it's like a, it's like a it's like a celebrity reading tmz like you just it's not for you it's for the fans it's for other people it's not your business even though it is your business but it's not your business so i just i have no idea what people say um and that was never an issue um the way that it had worked out was uh, I think the company was struggling with their transition a little bit. So there were certain guys, especially for myself and the Bucks, being West Coast guys in a Northeastern-based company, like that's a hard investment to make. Um, but they were investing in a lot of people that were out West. You know, uh, Mike Bennett and Maria had moved to Los Angeles. Nigel McGinnis had moved to Los Angeles. They had guys from Texas coming in. Kenny King was a West Coast guy coming from Vegas. And... Uh, so we felt like, well, we're obviously being voted out. At, we're the odd ducks out as far as me, myself and the Bucks. We felt we're the odd ducks out as far as their uh, their choice of investment, which I can completely understand. You just you have to make a choice, and sometimes it's not about who's better. It's just do you want red or do you want blue? And they went with blue, and we're red. You know that's just the way it goes. But um, but uh, the way that it had worked out is we're we had a lighter and lighter schedule, and um, um, I don't know about them, but, like, I had been contacted by TNA because they wanted to reboost the X division. But, I mean, I can't – being under contract, I can't take that call, you know. Right. Um, right. WWE had, had reached out to me about coming in for, like, tryouts for SummerSlam and things like that. And they wanted to – basically inviting me to the NFL Combine, so to speak. And uh, I can't take that call either. Um And then uh I want to say there's some other stuff, but obviously those are two – the two main issues. So um, there's phone calls I can't take at the same time that there's matches that Ring of Honor won't make. So, <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> so, it, and then uh, it came down to one day they're, uh, they're saying, we're going to have you guys off almost indefinitely for a while. And uh, we were at TV and they had a production meeting, which they addressed it not for scheduling reasons but because i there's like a, a weird time where in a short amount of time a whole bunch of guys had done interviews tearing each other apart and they were <laughs> they were upset that everybody was bickering about that so they're they during during the production meeting they're like look you know we don't care if you guys do interviews and stuff like that but when you're doing it keep in mind that you have to go to work with these people like you know be adults and that type of speech and and uh and I think they were worried that some people were unhappy there. So they posed the question, which happens everywhere. I mean, in WWE, they do this, like, and it's basically, like, if you're not happy here, you know, raise your hand type thing. And they just said, you know, I remember them saying, look, if you feel like you're not happy here, you do better elsewhere, or there's something else that's right for you, then let us know. We're not going to, uh, we're not malicious. We want, we want what's best for you. Um, and I raised my hand not because of those issues, but because, you know, because of my own, and I, I raised my hand in front of the room, like, okay, well, I feel that way. So we went aside, and I just said, there's there's all these things coming up that I can't pursue that I would like to, and I don't want to leave. I would actually rather choose to be here, but you guys are struggling with your own thing. So, right. Because mm-hmm. to, be, to be honest, like, if they, if they, if, 
if things were different, like if they were investing in myself and the Bucks as opposed to Bennett and Kenny or whoever, then I would have gladly left the phone down when TNA or somebody else called. I would have been fine with that. Right. Um, I was happy with my job, but but that's how it was, and they were super amicable about it. They said they understood. They even offered to contact them for me as a segue. Like, can we help out with these opportunities that you've kind of already missed? Hmm. Um, and the door's been open ever since. So the um, I never had anything lined up with TNA prior to that just because I think that's just dirty business. I don't think you right. do that. Um, right. I'm sure some guys do, but I, I just I don't think that that's necessary. And um, me going shortly after that is just a product of me, you know, making that choice happen. But they were super cool about it. The door to this day is still open. Right. Um, so that, that rumor couldn't be any more false. Yeah, so. <laughs> it would have helped you facilitate yeah. that if, if, if needed. So Yeah, they, they, they kind of did, actually. I think they reached out to uh, one or both of the offices about about me just to let them know, hey, you know, he's he's okay to do business with. Um, yeah, they were cool about it. The internet strikes a gun. <laughs> <laughs> Friday well, I night. said it before. A lot of times that, like, if I told you what wrestling was really like, you would never believe me. That's what, that's what I tell everybody that asks stuff like that, just because it's so, people don't know any, like, it, there's so much stuff going on that people don't realize. But. Well, what do you mean by that? Do you mean that it's less malicious than people would think, or are you going it's a different, both. totally? I mean, there's, there's some people that are perceived as saints and they're not. There's some people that, that are, that are looked at as troublemakers and they're not. There's some business, related things that they that are unfold a certain way and nobody would ever in a million years guess that that's how it worked out you know just it's both i mean sometimes that it's just almost consistently people are guessing right and it's actually left like it's just it's you know i could i've i've got about 10,000 follow up questions and but we've gone about twice as long as we were supposed to <laughs> <laughs> and you know, you've, you've, you've certainly lived up to your reputation as a fascinating interview subject, and uh, we'd love to have you back sometime because I could – let me tell you, I can do a solid hour just talking, you know, ROH. Or, yeah, I yeah, wouldn't even know, get into that uh, in any detail yet. Or, or, the, or the door that you just opened with all of these, you know, you know, false perceptions of the wrestling business. I mean, it's just fascinating stuff. I had a whole line of questioning about working different, you know uh, – styles you know whether it be mexico japan united states and we're not even going to get the half of it so uh you know this was just fantastic but um unfortunately we are out of time um so hopefully we can get a part two at some point not to put you on the spot <laughs> but yeah, absolutely. Spot. yeah you have to any, come back any no, you time, have to. You don't have a choice, it's so. my pleasure <laughs> you don't have a choice you're coming back <laughs> Friday night, June twenty eighth. It's Circus Maximus. That's St. Louis Anarchy. SLA Wrestling dot com. It'll be in Alton, Illinois. Tickets starting at ten dollars, and you can see our guest TJ Perkins. Uh, two out of three falls against ACH. It feels like it was about four days ago that we talked about that match, and uh, it was <laughs> it was just tremendous having you on. Uh, this was a great interview, and I, and I thank you very much for doing this. No, thanks very much, guys. It's uh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. And anytime, anytime. Absolutely. No, we'll, we're, we're holding you that to, to that for sure. So we'll see you next time on the Voice of Wrestling.com and Virtual Sports Network Crossing Podcast. TJ, thanks again. Yep.